Excellent. Dear Minister Maisch, dear Excellencies, dear Rector Palage, dear colleagues and students, ladies and gentlemen, since more than 18 months, we suffer from a virus pandemic which has no comparison in our days. And despite we believe that we may overcome this now by vaccination, I'm afraid that COVID-19 will keep us busy for quite some time due to its long-term consequences. Post-COVID-19, long-19, COVID-19 long haulers, chronic COVID-19 syndrome, and long COVID are all umbrella terms which try to capture and describe symptoms and complaints which arise long after the initial infection by the virus. And you see here the heart, the lung, the gut, but as you may easily recognize, most of the symptoms which patients are suffering from arise from an involvement of the brain. And just, by the way, for a neurologist, the eye is not more than a part of the brain which has grown too far. Now, how can the virus inflict the brain? There are various ways, and one is direct encephalitis and neuroinflammation, and in a minute I will show you a case. There's vasculitis and vasculopathy. There is systemic inflammation and the so-called cytokine storm, which harm the brain. There is the induction of autoimmune antibody generation against neuronal antigens, which can, in the long term, affect brain function and morphology. And there's the peripheral dysfunction and failure of organs, which directly affect the brain. And last but not least, we have to take into account that therapies may not only be beneficial, but also can affect brain function and morphology over time. Now, this is giving you an example how the virus can enter the brain. And you see here Twitch positive olfactory axons which penetrate the bone and end in the nasal cavity. And as an example, you see here that there's SARS-CoV-2 in these nerve endings and in a higher magnification down here in yellow, you see SARS-CoV-2 residing in these neurons. And this phenomenon may actually be responsible for the frequently reported loss of smell and taste, which COVID sufferers report. Now, this is a case of a 19-year-old Japanese male, which has been admitted to a hospital very early in the first wave of the pandemic due to an increasing uh, frequency of seizures, which are, uh, was arising from uh, a hippocampal encephalitis, as you can see in the, his MRI. And we know by now that acute COVID uh, uh, affects the brain mainly uh, very often by loss of smell and taste, but direct encephalitis, stroke, epilepsy, and delirium. Now, one half may guess that by looking just at acute cases, the long-term consequences could also affect neurocognitive functions. And this is a study that looked to a PET uh, measure. This is uh, visualizing glucose utilization as uh, an indicative for the neuronal uh, activation. And here you can see red uh, indicates red as indicates high activity and blue and green low activity. And I hope you can see that in these control cases there is there is in the cortex, a red signal over the entire cortex. When we compare this to the COVID case, this is entirely gone. So this tells you that there is less neuronal activity in these patients in widespread areas of the brain. And it was highly correlated with uh, loss of executive abilities, dysfunction of memory and attention, and problems with visual construction in these uh, patients. Now, this is a quote from one of the patients I saw myself very early, six months after the first wave, and he told me that he would have not had major uh, difficulties with the infection itself, apart from loss of smell and taste. 
but six months after, he had lost memory function and uh, compromising his exam preparations. And since then, things have gone worse. Over the year 2020, our uh, outpatient unit for dementia cases saw an increasing percentage of COVID cases, so that in August we had to start a new outpatient uh, clinic just for COVID cases, because we couldn't see our normal dementia patients any longer. Now, could we have learned from history and foresee what was coming? I guess so, but sometimes it's hard to look into the past. But the Russian flu, for example, had cases in the aftermath that were suffering from psychosis and anxiety. Well known as the Spanish flu and the so-called catatonia or encephalitis lethargica, described by von Economo, an Austrian neurologist, for the first time and addressed in the movie Awakenings with Robert De Niro uh, for quite some time in the 80s. Now, in the subsequent decade, there were a number of Parkinson's symptoms uh, being observed uh, or globally. And in the more recent SARS or MERS infections in 2003 and 2012, memory dysfunction, attention deficits, and loss of concentration and focus was frequently observed years after patients had suffered from initial infection. Now, you can see here that we, we already had people wearing masks or uh, social isolation with uh, uh, closed public places. So there are not so many new things. Now, we now know that COVID sufferers, long COVID sufferers, have a loss of processing speed, have verbal memory deficits and attention deficits. Less frequently, they suffer from headache, muscle pain, and Guillain-Barré syndrome which is uh, um, paresis. Now, 60 to 80% of COVID cases may suffer from one isolated or a combination of several of these symptoms. This shows you that these symptoms are not functionally only, but COVID-19 as a long chronic syndrome affects brain morphology. In red, you see gray matter volume reduction, so loss of brain tissue in the red areas. And in blue, you see the loss of axonal integrity. That is directly correlated to processing speed, because as your axons lose integrity, as slower information is being processed. Now, we quite early um, predicted in the first wave that something was happening like this. And I wrote this article supposing that the cytokine storm would be the major hit to the brain. And um, we, so, uh, we even suggested a single signal transduction pathway being responsible uh, for that in this paper. And we set out and asked uh, the funding agencies to support two studies. One, which was founded by, on, uh, by the NIH, and it's running at UMass in Worcester, and the second, which has been uh, funded now by the BMBF in Germany. It's a COVID moon study. And I want to show you two findings of these studies, which we already know, which are cross-sectional, of course, of nature, but I think they are important to predict what is going to happen. Here, we see that patients who have a severe uh, form of uh, initial COVID infection compared to asymptomatic initial COVID infection show no difference, which is a surprise. In both cases, brain function, and in this case, verbal memory, has been hit hard in comparison to control cases. And this is paralleled by a loss of brain volume in the temporal lobe. This is this brain area over here. So you can clearly see that within one year, these cases have lost volume of their brain, and it's most likely that this volume is never coming back. Now, we know that people after COVID-19 infection have a very hard way back to work. And this schematic 
by Davis and uh, colleagues shows you this bar graph over here that people are severe and not recovered cases are not working to more than 20%. Most of them have reduced hours and only a few, about 20%, 25% are back to work without any impact on their capabilities. On the other hand, people who are recovered have also reduced hours, which may indicate that they are not yet fully recovered, and about 40 to 45% have fully recovered and are back to work. But so, this is a long-term impact which also uh, directly hits our working power. Next to neurological symptoms, psychiatric symptoms can appear isolated or in conjunction with neurological deficits. And most well-known are the uh, anxiety behaviors, the obsessive compulsory behavior, uh, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder, all limiting the ability of these people to function in their daily life properly. Now, we have another pandemic, which is not so clear, but which many of us may experience in their immediate environment. We will see over the next three decades a rise of dementia cases from currently 44 million to 150 million cases worldwide. And we suppose that COVID-19 through long neuro-COVID is directly enhancing the numbers and aggravating uh, the uh, um, acceleration of disease in these cases. We believe that there are various mechanisms, and one is the inflammatory hit to the brain, which is my personal uh, scientific speciality, so I will not allude to this, but i give you another example. Social isolation, loneliness, reduced physical therapy and attention, and logopedics may really harm patients. Why is that the case? This is work by my friend and colleague, Carl Kottman. And what Carl Kottman did, he looked to people who were in a nursing home in England. And he had three categories here. People who would be not moved over an entire week, so no physical activity whatsoever. People who would have one uh, walk, walking hour. Oops one walking hour per week, and people who would have two walking hours per week. And now you see that in this cognitive scale, people who are sedentary and have no physical activity progress in, it, in their cognitive decline. People who have one walking hour are more or less stable. But people who are physically active and have two hours of activity, they show even an improvement. Now, that reinforces that isolation and less attention will dramatically impact on, in this case, Alzheimer patients. Now, what has to be done now? I believe that we have to support centers that really focus on, on studies uh, that have their neurocognitive uh, uh, form and consequences of uh, COVID-19 as a major focus. Um, we need to develop cognitive rehabilitation because there's first indication that this could actually help. We need to search for therapies, for acute therapies, during the infection itself, but also for long COVID cases. And we have to initiate studies which are actually focusing on recovery and on progression and really test what we can do to make the life of long COVID-19 sufferers better. There is the test for efficacy of pharmacological uh, interventions, but also non-pharmacological interventions, as I just alluded to. And these, oops, these studies need to be designed and financed for long. We will be judged as medical doctors by history how much information we now accumulate for subsequent generations. I remember my virologist teacher in 92 predicting exactly such a pandemic. He also predicted the, the site where it would arise from. 
We also need to think of our kids. We have much less data on the development of kids. And there is an indication from a US study that kids born during the virus pandemic have a uh, reduction of primary intelligence, which would be a dramatic hit. Now, we all need to accumulate this evidence not only for ourselves, but also for the coming generations, because there will be a next virus pandemic. It's not a question when, it's not a question if, it's a question when. Now, and beyond this, we all have experienced a very strange thing over the past uh, couple of months. People who were completely denying COVID-19, protesting and uh, neglecting the, uh, the opportunity to get a vaccine. Vaccine protesters, we call them in Germany. And uh, during these protests, uh, a colleague of mine was uh, sending me a WhatsApp with this text, people who believe that mRNA vaccines will change their genome editing should welcome the opportunity. And the first thing was, of course, it put a smile on my face, but the second thing was that may not be right. They're just not informed enough. They're just not sure enough that they can trust research and science. And that, in fact, may be another duty for a university like us. We need to provide information in a way, in a form, that enables everybody to understand, to trust, and to get treatment and get protection. And I think this is something we could do better in future times. And with this, I thank you for your attention, and I hope you all get vaccinated.